As a real estate agent, you should be well-versed on fair housing laws and how they relate to your actions, advertisements, and conversations with your clients. However, lenders are also responsible for adhering to various fair housing laws, and you should also be familiar with these concepts. In this chapter, we will review in detail fair housing laws and how they relate to financing. First, we will examine what is prohibited under the Federal Fair Housing Act and then take a look at some real-world examples. Lenders are prohibited from denying the following services based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, or handicap. Lenders cannot refuse to issue a mortgage or refinance a loan. This item is pretty straightforward. If someone feels they are financially sound enough to qualify for a mortgage but are denied for no apparent reason, they may want to consider filing a complaint. Lenders cannot refuse to provide information about loan programs. Lenders cannot try to impact an appraisal. This practice is also referred to as lowballing. We will review this later in the chapter. Lenders cannot impose a higher rate or adverse payment terms. Applicants should be offered similar terms as anyone who has identical or similar finances. Lenders cannot offer different terms for purchasing a loan. The courts have recognized three different types of lending discrimination. Now we will briefly review each one and provide a few examples. Overt evidence of disparate treatment can be shown to exist through actual statements showing the lender took into consideration a prohibited factor when making a lending decision. Also, disparate treatment can be demonstrated by presenting evidence that one was treated differently which cannot be explained by the lender showing non-discriminatory factors such as income or credit history. Consider overt evidence of disparate treatment as blatant prejudice in lending practices. For example, if someone walks into a bank and is told they cannot have a loan due to their race, this is considered overt evidence. The second type is comparative evidence of disparate treatment, and it is much more likely to occur. Comparative evidence often happens with applicants that are considered on-the-line applicants, meaning their approval criteria is the middle of the road and the lender has more discretion as to whether or not to issue an approval. Without a perfect financial history, this type of discrimination can be difficult to prove. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose you have two loan candidates with the same credit and income, both looking to purchase similar homes in the same neighborhood, and both have the same amount of late payments on their credit history. The lender approves the white applicant for the loan, but a black person is denied. In this case, the applicant could claim disparate treatment. If looked at each case, on its own, the late payments might seem like a reason to deny the loan. However, if you look at the cases side by side, you can see the comparative evidence. Disparate impact occurs when a lending institution applies a neutral policy equally across applicants. However, the policy results in a group of people being unfairly burdened or excluded. This type of discrimination may not be intentional, but it can have a negative impact on a large group of people for an extended period of time. Let's take a look at an example that has occurred quite a few times in the real world. A lender makes a policy that the minimum loan they will issue in a particular state is $250,000. This system is not put in place knowing it would hurt anyone, but was purely a business decision. The policy remains in place for 15 years, and when the statistics are reviewed years later, it shows that this policy has led to almost no minorities being issued loans, 
because their loans typically fall under the bank's minimum loan requirement in the state. While the bank did not initially set out to discriminate, this can be seen by the courts as disparate impact. It is important for banks to carefully review their policies and make sure they do not inadvertently discriminate. As a real estate agent, it is not your responsibility to review your client's loan terms or denial of financing to determine if there has been discrimination. Lending can be a sensitive situation, especially if your client is denied. It is, however, important for you to be aware of the resources available to your client in the event they feel they have been discriminated against. They can file a formal complaint on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development website. Also, they should hire an attorney to represent their interests in the legal matter. Now, we will review redlining. Unfortunately, redlining has played a large role in lending throughout history and as a result is an important part of real estate education that you should know and be aware of when working with clients. The Housing Act of 1968 explicitly prohibits the practice of redlining. Redlining involves denying a person based on their race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, or handicap in a particular area based on the demographics in that area. Redlining means that lenders are drawing lines around specific neighborhoods and decide, in advance, not to approve loans in that area based on the racial or ethnic makeup of the neighborhood. Redlining does not mean lenders have to approve all loans in minority neighborhoods or otherwise be accused of breaking the law. Lenders can take the following factors into consideration when approving or denying a loan. Credit history. Income. Property condition. Property condition includes not only the condition of the property in question, but also the condition of the properties in the surrounding area. Neighborhood amenities and city services provided to the neighborhood. These types of considerations can impact the value of the home in question. Lender's portfolio. The lender can take into consideration how that particular loan will affect the organization's overall risk profile. Let's take a look at a recent case that resulted in one of the largest settlements in history. Hudson City Saving Bank was ordered to pay a $33 million settlement for avoiding issuing loans to Latinos and African Americans in minority neighborhoods. Prosecutors were able to show that even though the bank went through a significant expansion, less than 6% of the new branches were opened in minority neighborhoods. It was clear the bank was actively avoiding lending to minority groups. As a result, the bank had to make a large payout as well as open new branches in the minority neighborhoods they had avoided. There are many real-life examples in recent years that indicate redlining still remains an issue in minority neighborhoods. As an agent, you should be aware of the seriousness of the situation and be able to point your clients in the right direction if they feel they are being discriminated against. Now, we will review the various regulations and statutes that are addressed by the Federal Fair Housing Act and review some specific acts it prohibits. It is important to keep in mind that the act was written broadly to encompass a wide range of activities that could be considered discrimination. One of the main parts of the act is focused on redlining, but since we covered that earlier in the chapter, we will concentrate on the other parts of the statute. The Fair Housing Act specifically prohibits lowballing. 
Lowballing occurs when a low appraisal is made based on discrimination. This is a form of redlining and can force the borrower to have to cancel the sales contract or have to pay the difference between the price and the loan amount. If a lender wanted to discriminate against the borrower but could find no valid reason to deny the loan, trying to push for a low appraisal would be another way to deny the loan. For example, let's say a lender does not want a loan to go through due to the applicant's religion, but could find no reason to deny the application. They could try to get the appraisal to come in low, knowing the buyer most likely does not have the cash to make up the price difference and will be forced to cancel the contract through the appraisal contingency. After the mortgage crisis, lenders and appraisers cannot be in contact anymore. There should be an independent third party between them to avoid conflicts. However, lowballing is a practice that as an agent you should be aware of. The Fair Housing Act also prohibits the use of racially exclusive images. For lenders, this means making sure their advertisements do not appear to only be geared toward a particular race, religion, or age group. This extends to advertisements when it comes to languages. For example, if a lender is located in a predominantly Spanish-speaking neighborhood, that does not mean that all of the ads should be geared towards the Latino community. The ads can show that there are Spanish-speaking loan officers, However, the ads should indicate the loan products are available to everyone. As an agent, you should be aware of these laws and make sure your clients understand they cannot be discriminated against in the lending process. If they mention to you that they feel this may have happened to them, you should inform them about the ability to file a claim. Also, you want to remind the client that you cannot give legal advice and they may want to hire an attorney. The Fair Housing Act also prohibits making the lending process more difficult for applicants as a result of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, or handicap at various stages of the lending process. There are three main ways that the Act addresses the process to prevent potential discrimination. The first way is to make sure lenders do not apply excessively burdensome qualification standards. Essentially, the law indicates that if a lender makes qualifying so burdensome so that in effect it is the same as just denying the applicant, then it can be considered discrimination. The second way the statute accomplishes this is by making it illegal for lenders to impose more onerous terms. This includes interest rates and terms and conditions. Finally, the practice of making the application process more difficult in terms of paperwork, etc., for a particular class of people is also prohibited. As an agent, you will learn that the loan process can become very stressful for buyers. It is a lot of paperwork, and for too many applicants, it seems like the lender is asking for the same information over and over again. However, you should be able to tell if it seems like some of your clients are being forced to jump through hoops that your other clients are not. If this is the case, you may want to encourage your clients to ask a few more questions and consult with an attorney. Finally, racial steering is prohibited under the Act. Racial steering is when a lender pushes an applicant towards a particular loan product or geographic area based on race. For example, let's say a buyer is deciding on two properties in two different neighborhoods. 
If the lender finds out about the two houses and gives the buyer superior loan terms for one of the houses in one of the neighborhoods based on their race, this could be considered racial steering.